you know, thank God that the rules are changing because it's made it easier for me because back in the beginning it was very difficult. You know, starting out tattooing back then, we didn't wear gloves, we didn't cover anything, you know, you just tattoo. Tattoo Now has been helping connect tattoo collectors and the curious with world-class talent from all around the globe since the mid-90s. You are invited to join us as we dive into the heart of tattoo now! Welcome tattooers, apprentices, collectors, and the curious. It's an unbelievable show. I know we say that every single time, uh, but it is what it is. Uh, well, last January, I was able to pack up all the gear and head on over to the Golden State Tattoo Expo in, in Pasadena, California. And California is obviously a, a heart, a mecca of tattooing, and so it was beautiful to be immersed in uh, not only the weather, but again, the full-on California tattoo culture. During that trip, we were able to have an amazing interview with Carrier Barba, who has spent decades, you know, doing her thing, uh, but paving new ways. You know, she was one of the very first tattooers to start using gloves and, and protective uh, measures, uh, you know, and, and bloodborne pathogens, uh, barriers and whatnot, uh, as well as just making sure that uh, regardless of who you are, you can engage in this amazing art. So, very thankful to have an, uh, a really inspirational interview with her, or at least a clip of it. A couple weekends ago, Guy Aitchison did a great interview with Jesse Smith, who's another uh, fantastic inspirational tattooer. I know I, you must be getting tired of me saying this, but when you check out their work and hear the spirit straight from them, I think you'll understand. And then last but not least, or actually I guess first in the order, we have Babara Shorazin. I met her over at the Bucharest Tattoo Convention. Thank you very much, Kosti, for having us over. And she was too busy there to catch up with, so we did a Skype, Zoom, I don't know, we did some sort of video conferencing interview and you're going to be ecstatic. If you don't know her work, uh, you will. For now, I'm your host, Gabe Ripley. Find me on Instagram, Gabe Ripley, or on the internet, GabeRipley.com. You're not going to find me at any tattoo conventions anytime soon, but you will catch me at the virtualtattoogathering.com. Before we start the show, I have to tell you all about our awesome sponsors that make this possible. First up, the Virtual Tattoo Gathering. It's an actual virtual tattoo convention. We can't get there in person, but we can all beam in. So, virtualtattoogathering.com. The, the lineups are just unbelievable. You can catch it live or the on-demand replays. And there's already like dozens of hours of amazing tattoo content, both for collectors and curious, as well as for professional for professionals, for, for tattooers and whatnot. There's a whole seminar room. And um, yeah, if you go to Tattoo Education to get verified as a tattooer or an apprentice, then you will get the link or the password for the seminar room. But either way, if you love tattoos and you miss tattoo conventions, www.virtualtattoogathering.com. Inkjet stencils. Okay, so catch this. You can get into your computer or your iPad, uh, treat your tattoo images uh, appropriately, and then print out the stencils straight from your inkjet. It, pretty amazing technology. Uh, inkjetstencils.com. It's pretty cool. They've been working and inventing for decades inside of the tattoo world. So, yes, inkjetstencils.com. Needle Jig Tattoo Supply, uh, artist owned and operated tattoo supply company, and they still vet every single order to make sure that their tattoo supplies are being sent to responsible uh, licensed tattoo artists. NeedleJigTattoo.com or for a discount, TattooNow.com slash NeedleJig. I believe it's 10% off the first order. d -Lies Pro is a healing wrap designed to, specifically designed to heal your tattoos. Yeah, it's very comfortable. I've, I've used it a couple times. There's a ton of amazing artists that do. It was uh, brought to you by Alex DePasse. d -Lies Pro Healing Wrap. Do a search for that in the States. Uh, and outside of the United States, where I actually can't get to right now, um, Dermalize. Speaking of Alex DePasse, he has a couple different apps that he's been working on. So go to the app stores of your choice and do a search for Palette Pro, where you can upload a picture and it will map out tattoo inks to the picture. It's pretty amazing stuff. Uh, Palette Pro. Also, Ink Squad is Alex's social media. The algorithms are designed to connect you with tattooers, not to deliver you as an advertiser. So that's Ink Squad and Palette Pro are these two awesome apps. Tattooers, are you still using paper towels? Might be kind of silly. You should check out Wipeouts, Mike DeVries's new invention, and again, another innovator in the tattoo world. I'm just going to let a testimonial speak for Wipeouts themselves. This one's from uh, Ryan Ashley. Hey, I need all the Wipeouts. Arlo took the whole bag you gave me, and I am obsessed with them. Again, designed specifically for tattooers. So go to tattoonow.com slash 
Wipeouts, W-I-P-E-O-U-T-Z. Tattoo studios that you should be going to as either a tattooer or a client. Super Genius Tattoo in Seattle, Washington is headed up by the legendary Damon Conklin. No Idols Tattoo in New York City, owned and operated by John Mesa, who's on TV, but whatever. He's a badass tattooer in the heart of New York City in Chinatown. It's a great place. Uh, he's got some videos that we'll be showing you later. Loose Screw Tattoo in Richmond, Virginia, an amazing destination for collectors. And if you are a tattooer, definitely uh, look them up. He's looking for guest artists and residents all the time. Best spotter a residency at Loose Screw, tattoonow.com slash loose screw. And then let them know you sent us. Let them know we sent you. Reinventing the Tattoo, Guy Aitchison's, uh, used to be a textbook, almost like a college textbook on tattooing. It is now an online uh, subscription resource. That is all, the book, it's expanded chapters, it's got guest videos from all sorts of tattooers to, to make sure that it's always staying current. And now that the internet is finally caught up to hyperspace, Guy's able to host regular group drawing exercises. So if you are missing getting together in person with fellow artists and talking tattoos and art, then go to reinventingthetattoo.com and start getting immersed in bettering yourself. And Tattoo Now, for over two decades, we've been helping amplify positive tattooers in, in a variety of different ways. Uh, consulting, websites, video production, uh, convention promotion, help with uh, events and whatnot. Um, TattooNow.com. If you are a tattooer looking for a gig, uh, we do a lot of recruiting and whatnot also. TattooNow.com. The number is 413-585-9134. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free, give a call, and we will see how uh, I can help. The last episode of the Tattoo Now show featured Emmy Blacksheep, Chet Czar and Gabe Leonard, uh, Joanna Farfarco, and A.D. Poncho. Uh, unbelievable show. Check it out on the YouTube uh, and the podcast or wherever you might consume me to do a search. Tattoo Now. Also, we have been getting our shows up on Cable Access TV again, so yeah, give your Cable Access TV a call. Tell them that you want to see the Tattoo Now show. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much to all of our sponsors. Please uh, support them. Let them know that you found out about them or heard about them again on the show. And uh, yeah, we're going to uh, show you a video of the virtual tattoo gathering recap. And again, all of these replays are for free. VirtualTattooGathering.com. Check out this video. And on the other side, we will be catching up with Barbora. introduced to our next guest's artwork and tattoos uh, via uh, some well-renowned tattooers and the Bucharest Tattoo Convention. And then when I was over there, uh, tried to, to introduce myself, but there was a, a crowd of people all around her booth all weekend long. It was amazing. Um, but I, I caught up at the very end and I'm ecstatic to catch back up with... Uh, now, how do I pronounce this? Um, I apologize. It's just uh, Sharuzen underscore art on Instagram? Yeah, Sharuzen. 
Yeah. Shrew is perfect. And uh, like I said, thank you so much for taking the time. I know that uh, you know, you're know you busy traveling around to lots of conventions, but um, it's going to be great to, to catch up and introduce you to uh, our network of, uh, of tattoo collectors. Yeah, thank you. I'm happy as well. Uh, awesome. And so uh, now for the people that are just uh, learning about you, do you want to tell us a little bit about how you got started? Now, you're, you're from Slovakia, or did you, did you start tattooing there? Yes. Uh, actually, no, not really. Um, it's a little bit longer story, to be honest. But uh, professionally, I started tattooing in London. Yeah, but I'm from Slovakia. Yeah, actually, I came to London. Uh, my dream was more like to do photography, to mm -hmm. do some modeling and and photography like a photographer. But then somehow the way how everything went was like was everything was too fast. It was from one day to another that I decided to go to UK. And mm. yeah, so I had no job, nothing, like literally no money. So, and then, uh, yeah, I started to tattoo. I found a job, I found a um, um, shop. And okay, I have to say, I had to lie a little bit. And yeah, mm. and I started to do tattoos, yeah. Oh, amazing. <laughs> so now, were, then, you, uh, were you getting tattooed at the time or? Um, no, no, no. 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 Because so you went straight from like paint. And now, uh, were you painting, or what kind of art background did you have? Yeah, actually, um, the thing is, I had like no school or anything about uh -huh. any drawing or painting. So uh, I was drawing and painting from when I remember. Mm -hmm. And yeah, because this is a little, it's a little bit like a longer story because as well with these tattoos and everything. So when I was at school. I on my friends and schoolmates, they always was just like bothering me, please draw something on me. So like every day I have to redraw the drawings and stuff like that. And then when I was like about 15, 14, 15, I actually tattooed myself, but oh, hmm. I didn't know really that I'm tattooing in the time. That's kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. story about but, that. But, uh, so. but you were, uh, obviously you were driven and, and attracted to the art uh, right from uh, right from the get-go. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, well, uh, before, before I start tattooing, as I said, I've been always drawing and painting, yeah. just like learning by myself. And I was doing the photography. So that was what I was doing before. And then I started to do the tattoos. Sure. I imagine that you're able to use uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the lessons that you learn in photography uh, as you're translating things into tattoos or in, into your paintings. Um, you know, a, a composition and whatnot. I mean, obviously the mediums are, are, are drastically different. Um, but obviously, so do you, you still do some photography. Obviously those skills, you know, come to use for you when you're doing your, your tattooing, I imagine. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's that's right. Yeah, one thing is, yeah, the composition. I mean, even the colors and everything. And I must say the painting helps a lot, especially with the color tattoos. It's like, it's a big help. So... Yeah, I mean, it's very different. I mean, the medium, but in the end, this is kind of the same thing. Sure. I mean, there's a lot of uh, lessons that will translate over. Now, what, what, what artistic mediums are you using? Are you an oil painter or, or acrylics or digital? Uh, I mean, I kind of use everything, but I love, yeah. I mean, the main thing is oil. Yeah. I like to draw as well. So it depends on the day. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Now, I saw recently you were doing some collaborative paintings, maybe at a recent guest spot? Oh, yeah, I just tried with my friend, yeah. So it was just like a very spontaneous thing, so we, yeah. But I would like to do more. It was fun, yeah, and you yeah. learn a lot, and yeah. And this was, a, what, what, what shop was this at? Oh, yeah, it was in UK, in Shrewsbury, in Mark's Literate um, shop, so it called One for Sorrow. Yeah. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah, for sure. I think uh, Tommy Lee maybe was there recently too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, cool. So, so how, yeah, how often? Cool yeah. Nice. How, how often do you do you travel? It seems like you're on the road quite a bit. Oh yeah, actually, yeah, it depends as well on the month, let's say. But yeah, I mean, every month at least I try to be somewhere. But sometimes it's more often. Yeah. Awesome. I like and to travel. Yeah. yeah. What What are some of your favorite places? Not Not at the risk of leaving anybody out, but are there some uh, specific spots mm -hmm. that you enjoy going to? Actually, I don't have like one or two favorites. To be honest, 
I enjoyed all of them where I was because it's always something different, you know. So yeah. it's difficult for me to say, okay, I just love this and I want to constantly come to this place. I like I like all of them in different ways, but yeah, it, it sometimes it matters about the people, the company, and yeah, sure. the whole country. Yeah. Awesome. Well, give us a little bit of uh, of a sampling of some of the places where you've been or, or where people that are watching might be mm -hmm. able to catch up with you at. Oh yeah, I mean. In Europe, like as I said, I'm based, uh, of course, now in Germany. So I travel a little bit around Europe. Then, yeah, I was in Asia for the conventions and oh, cool. in the US. Yeah, so. Awesome. Oh, no, so I see, we were there. Uh, was it Singapore and, and Taiwan, or was that the? Uh, yes, yes. I was in, uh, yeah, um, Singapore, uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Shanghai. That was uh, in uh, in Asia. I, I imagine and you took a lot of great pictures. Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Imagine a lot of your clientele is, is traveling in to get tattooed by you. Are there things that you recommend that they could do in, in your town? You know, other than, you know, after they're done with um, their tattoos, before or after, any art museums or? Yeah, actually the town where I'm staying is like, it's more like I'm kind of hiding, to be honest. There's not much wow. to do except drinking. Yeah, there's uh, okay. <laughs> lots of wine yards yeah, around. So good uh -huh. wine, yeah, very good wine. Uh, yeah, there is a nature and lots of castles. That's, awesome. that's very nice. Yeah. Uh, castle, kind of, yeah. Castle, castle field trips are some of my favorite for sure. It's um, amazing oh, how, cool. how old they are, right? And just to, to be able to visualize people in them. Yeah, and bunkers. Bunkers, lots of bunkers okay. from uh, war, yeah. That's, that's I forgot. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so now I imagine that you're pretty busy. Uh, now, do you have a, a wait list for people to, to try to get tattooed by you, or do you do you screen your tattoo ideas before? Or, or I guess the question is, what is the process that people can do to get tattooed by you? I mean, um, I'm kind of more open. I don't have really like a crazy waiting list or something. It's more about the communication. With, with the clients, like, okay, when they want to do the tattoo, and of course, for me, it's like, okay, I'm ready for this tattoo, so I will do that tattoo, but the important thing is that, um, because I want to travel, so mm -hmm. I try to keep my um, diary kind of more open, so, yeah, it's nothing like a crazy waiting list or something. Okay. Now, are there uh, specific tattoos that you lo you're interested in doing, or do you like to just tattoo anything that people will throw at you, or...? Uh, no, not really. Uh, of course, I, I like more like a fantasy, dark style. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I really like to just, let's say, just have no preparation before, just like to yeah sit down with the client and just like mm -hmm. do something so the people give me free hand. This is what I really like. Oh, so well, I don't then like and then you, you draw on yeah. them with Sharpie markers or... Oh, yes. Sometimes, of course, I do stencils as well, but that's more sure. like, um, yeah, if I know that maybe it's better for the client, like when you see the clients are more nervous and yeah, for them it's difficult to sit for sometimes to draw something. Or yeah, no. or if I really feel like, okay, I'm going to make some kind of quick stencil for some other reason, but yeah, sure. it's nothing. So you, you, often stencil. your process would include a, a little bit of both then maybe. So there's a, a consultation, so you might stencil mm -hmm. some stuff up ahead of time, but then a lot of it might just be there what, while you're uh, talking to the client and putting it on their body. And... Yeah, yeah, it's like, like a mix, I would say, yeah. What are some of your very mm -hmm. first memories of tattoos? Uh, to be honest, like I remember when I used to go to school there, like in our city, there was one tattoo studio. And okay, when I go to back home to, to bus station, then I have to like pass by. So uh -huh. everybody knows there is the tattoo studio. <laughs> but yeah, I, to be honest, I never really thought like I will ever do tattoos. Even if like my friends always tell me, yeah, it would be cool if you do. Uh -huh. But yeah, just at, at the studio, yeah. Because you were all interested in the photography and that was kind of your, your love until you got, you know, into the tattoo world or, or, or sucked into it, I suppose. I mean, yeah, more the painting, yeah, okay. but the, okay. the photography was a bit easier, you know, so to catch the, cool. the idea of what I had in my hand. T tattooing is, is very difficult on people's bodies, especially over the long period of time. Uh, do you do stretches or do you anything to try to keep healthy? Uh, while you're tattooing? 
oh yeah, I do workout. Yeah, I try mm-hmm. to do much as I can because, of course, for the back, yeah, it's it's good. Yeah. Yeah. So, do, have you already had back problems or? Walks. Uh, it's not like back problems, not the problem, oh. but like a, a normal thing that when you sit for a long time in a weird sure. position, that's it. Um, amongst your different mediums, it, it looks like some of your paintings and creations are being made into clothing. Uh, I think I saw a couple different uh, uh, t-shirts on your website. you, you want to tell us a little bit about some of the, the clothing that you have available? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm working with uh, Salem, so I did two awesome. t-shirts for now for them, yeah. And yeah, now I did uh, one design for Sea Shepherd. So cool. And those are all available now from your, from your website, or? Um, actually, not from my website. I have some uh, available at the convention that's that's possible to buy. But cool. uh, yeah, just from their website, from distributors, from Salon Clothing. And your travels? Do you, do you visit many art museums? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, like every big city, it's good to go for like, of course, like in New York, you have the Met Museum, that's really oh. cool to go, of course, but yeah, every, every big city have a super cool museum. Sometimes you can find, for example, paintings which you're searching for for four years, and then it's mm. just the one painting in that museum, small museum. But what I have to say, what was really cool, what surprised me was in Russia. Like, mm. not many people go to Russia, but it's really worth to go to see the paintings in Moscow. Or in oh, cool. St. Petersburg, it's that's with the word to go. Yeah. That was a clip of the Babora interview. You could find the full interview. Tattoonow.com slash YouTube will bring you to the right channel. Hopefully she makes it over to the States and gets visas squared away. It would be a tremendous opportunity for Americans to get tattooed by her. Right now we can't get over there, but uh, hopefully we will be able to soon. And uh, if you're from Europe, make sure you get your ass over to Berlin. Next up, we have Jesse Smith's interview with Guy Aitchison, or a clip of it from the previous virtual tattoo gathering. So please enjoy. fun at the virtual tattoo gathering um, been popping around and looking at the various different booths and seeing what people are up to <clears throat> right now we're about to start an interview with mr. Jesse Smith he's a uh, loose screw tattoo in uh, enrichment and uh, Jesse is known for his sort of like crazy cartoon style he was doing it before there was such a thing as new school uh, although I think they've started calling that that pretty early on and uh, yeah, we're going to talk with Jesse a little bit about his history and and, uh, and some of the things that he's up to right now, which you know, extend beyond simply tattooing. Jesse, thank you for joining us here today. Uh, thanks for having me, Guy. So uh, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, you've pretty much always been known for for this uh, this cartoon style. Is that something that you started doing right off the bat, or kind of came into tattooing already, uh, being a fan of? Yeah, so you know, I started doing art early in my life, just like most most artists. And you know, I was always copying skateboard designs and Mad Magazine, uh, you know, Garbage Pail Kids, Dungeons and Dragons. And then in about '93, I moved to Germany, and the graffiti scene was insane there. And they were doing a lot of like cartoony, you know, new school. They you know, it wasn't called new school in the graffiti world, but they were doing graffiti, new schooly type stuff. And I was doing that before I even started tattooing. So when I started tattooing, you know, I was, there was people like um, Jimmy Litwalk and Gunner and Clean Rock One, uh, Tim Bedren, all those guys were kind of, you know, basically paving the way for, I mean, shoot, you were doing new school back in the days. And so was, uh, um, I used to work for Bugs. Bugs used to do new school. 
I think, uh, you know, of course you had Joe Capbianco and um, shit, Jack Rudy was doing new schooly type stuff back then. So, you know, it was, it was definitely like, you know, there was a, a different voices. You know, some people are coming from the hot rod scene. Some people are coming from the comic book scene. You know, I was coming from the graffiti scene. Uh, and of course, Saturday morning cartoons were pretty prevalent back in most of our early days. So I think all that was kind of feeding into it. So you've pretty much been able to focus on on that style of your entire career. For the most part. I mean, you know, obviously when I started tattooing, just like a lot of people, uh, you know, I was in a production shop and I was tattooing tramp stamp, butterfly, tribals and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, and then also I went to art school and in art school, you know, we were forced to focus on still lifes and figure drawing and stuff like that. But outside of, you know, stuff that I was forced to do, I was doing my own stuff. Um, what, what was your apprenticeship like? Yeah, I didn't have an apprenticeship. I actually, uh, I started, I was in the military when I started tattooing. And I remember um, I used to just run in the artistic circles with just artists in general. Back then you didn't have the internet. So you just kind of found an artist and you hang out with him and he knew an artist, you hang out with them and you just kind of sifting through the artistic circles. And I stumbled across this guy named Carlos uh, who was tattooing out of his house, who had learned how to tattoo out of prison, uh, making a ghetto gun. There's a Walkman motor and a toothbrush. And, uh, and then, you know, eventually I didn't really plan on being a tattoo artist. I just hung out with him and drew. And sometimes he would tattoo my design. And then eventually he was like, Hey, you want to do one? And I said, sure. Uh, you know, the goal was just, uh, I just thought it was crazy that somebody would want my artwork on them for the rest of their lives. So it was exciting to do art in general. Um, much less put it on someone on their skin for the rest of their lives. So I did that. And then being that I was in the military, the guy I tattooed the first tattoo on, he was in the military. He went back and he showed all the people and they were like, Oh man, I want to get tattooed. And you know, I wasn't even charging back then because I was just decorating surfaces uh, for free. I was now, I remember I had like a little t-shirt company. I would make the t-shirts for uh, $18 and then I would sell them for 10. You know, it's like, <laughs> The money was never a, a primary focus when it came to art for me. You know, I, I was making my money off the military, um, so I didn't really need the money to survive. Yeah, I, I mean, I remember the first time I, I did a walk-in, and, and this is after you know, a, little, a pretty much standard apprenticeship, and uh, my boss, uh, Bob Oslin, he beckons me into the back room, locks the door, lights up the joint, and hands me, you know, $72.50. I'm like, what's this for? It's like, you just got paid for a tattoo. I'm like, oh, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> like, I was just so stoked that I had just done a walk in and you know what I mean? And I didn't mess it up too bad. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. Yeah. And that was, I mean, I never realized how, how much money, you know, a tattoo was worth back then. I mean, I was charging $20 for, I remember I charged this dude a hundred dollars for a full tribal torso that I did with one needle. <laughs> like, Which took you know, long? I mean, it took me, it took me a long time. And, you know, I had to go over every line seven times to get one solid line in. And, uh, you know, I just talked to the guy the other day, it's still not done healing. And that was 23 years ago. <laughs> so uh, at what point did you end up in an actual shop? So, yeah, I tattooed for about a year and a half out of the house. Um, mostly I was, you know, I was in the military most of that time. And then after I got out of the military, I, I moved up to Richmond, Virginia uh, to go to VCU to study art. And while I was up there, I started airbrushing at King's Dominion. I was drawing uh, caricatures. Uh, and then I was also fishing my portfolio around the tattoo shops. And in the middle of uh, 99, I landed my first job at a tattoo shop. and uh, I actually got fired like two weeks later. The, uh, <laughs> they had, they had a, the, the owner came in and he was looking at my work. He's like, you got good work, but I want to run you through a kind of a quick apprenticeship. And I said, sure. So I'm doing this apprenticeship. I'm tracing things, coloring things, doing whatever he tells me to do. And one day he comes in and he's like, Hey man, we got this new piercer. Would you mind letting her practice piercing your belly button? And I was like, no, oh, get my belly button pierced. That's a, that's a, you know, not my thing. And, 
and he lifted his shirt up and he had his belly button pierced and I got fired the next day. So I don't know if it was specifically for that, but he basically just told me I wasn't good enough. And then I left and I was super depressed and I, uh, you know, tattooed out of my house for another six months and then fished my portfolio around again and eventually landed a job. And then just from that point on, I just tattooed continuously. So here's a question. And I think this is important because so many really good tattooers that are solid parts of this industry, uh, had to start out that way. And yeah, we always try to encourage everyone to try to get into shop, but it's not always possible. Uh, right. I mean, it, I was really lucky, but you know, of course I had to work in a shop that was owned by a raging heroin addict. And, and you know, I mean, it was like, it came with a cost back then and it was, would have been even harder if you were a woman, you know? I mean, uh, you know, 30 years ago, especially, it was, I, I wouldn't have even known what shop to send someone to. Like my, my sister, she started her apprenticeship about you know, 10 years after uh, I did. And by that point I knew some solid people. I was able to say, okay, you'd be safe in this shop, you know? Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's crazy how everything has changed. And, you know, I, I kind of, uh, you know, obviously I had an advantage of being a guy uh, going into the tattoo world and I had a decent portfolio back then. Um, you know, it was back in a time where a lot of tattooists weren't really artists. They were just, you know, they would just copy stuff. So, uh, me coming in there with a portfolio full of art, um, you know, definitely put dollar signs in their eyes, you know, and they were like, Oh, we'll bring this guy on to make some money for us. Um, but you know, I was a little hip hop skater kid, you know, I listened to, uh, hip hop music. And back then there was probably, there was barely anyone in the industry that listened to hip hop music. So whenever I'd go into a shop, you know, if I put in some music, I was definitely, you know, they'd grab my CD out and fling it across the, the shop or, you know, I'd get a lot of negative, you know, a lot of negative uh, rhetoric towards my choice of music. And you know, it was definitely, definitely a tough to get in being anything other than, uh, you know, someone who listened to more like rock and roll or metal or something like that. So it's funny how something like tattooing could be so conformist. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, I think, I think all situations are kind of like that. People build their crews. And then when somebody different tries to come into that crew, that person gets kind of like ousted. And then when that person gets ousted, then they build their own little crew over here. And then they oust anybody. It's not like that. You know, it's like that whole tribal type mentality. Yeah. It's funny though. Cause then you get these shops where they have this totally democratic approach to uh, the playlist. I, I know that uh, that Russ does this, right? Where uh, you've got the wackiest music mix, but it's like, you know, that's how you accommodate everybody. Right. Yeah, we did a situation like that where we had a Spotify account. We just had everybody kind of plug in their favorite group and play radio stations connected to those groups. And it would just kind of rotate. And, you know, I learned a long time ago, you know, I really never felt good when people would talk shit about my music. So I just stopped talking shit about other people's music. <laughs> but it's almost inevitable that when when you when you have a group of people and you play music, somebody is going to talk shit about it, no matter what it is, you know. Yeah. So how long have you been a shop owner? So I opened my shop up almost ten years ago. I think it was uh, May of two thousand eleven. So about nine years ago, um, I had been tattooing for about fourteen years uh, when I when I opened it, and um, yeah, I was just kind of ready to to do my own thing. It was, uh, you know, I, in, in working at those shops, I kind of figured out what I liked and what I didn't like. And I was ready to kind of pull it in. And, you know, I had a pretty substantial waiting list back then, um, that, you know, I was, I was dishing off to all the local tattoo shops. And I was like, man, it would make a lot more sense for me to have a shop where I could dish this off to people who I could get a percentage of. Um, so there was like multiple reasons of, of doing that. Um, and then I opened the shop and a year later I got hit up by the, the TV show. And then it was just like a freaking a wave of chaos past that point between, you know, having a shop and then hitting a, a level of celebrity status that I never thought I would ever, uh, ever hit. And then of course, you know, the people around you are feeling a little different because you're in a different position regardless of your acting different your people are treating you different you know um so it's just a lot of a lot of chaos stemmed from 
from that, you know, open the shop and then straight into TV stuff. And then boom, it's just been a wave all the way in. You feel like it's kind of settled down and you, you figured out what Lou Screw is, is about and all that. Yeah. I mean, I, I think so. You know, it, it, it took a while because, you know, you kind of go in and open a shop and, and you have these certain intentions and you kind of just assume that the people who are working there have the same idea of what's right and wrong or how things work. And then you realize that they don't. So then you have to be very clear of here's my boundaries. Here's what I expect from an artist working at my shop. And, you know, that way I've noticed that the, the, the newer artists I have less problems with because I've, been very clear about where the boundaries are whereas before i thought that the boundaries that i had were normal to you know someone else's boundaries and you realize that you know some artists aren't as clean and some artists don't uh, aren't concerned about showing up to work on time or having their drawings ready or whatever which way it is so then you have to get in there and say hey you know if you aren't on time to work then this client's going to be upset because they got a babysitter or whatever and then I get a bad review on Lou Screw. They're not going to give you a bad review. They're giving me a bad review. Right. So it's just been a lot of like learning about what it is that I expect out of people and being able to clearly communicate that to them, you know? So then beyond that, you took on an even bigger responsibility when you uh, took over the Richmond Convention. Now, uh, worth noting, the Richmond Convention was the first show I ever worked. That was way back in 1989 when Crazy Ace ran it. And then uh, it became Billy Eason's uh, uh, legacy for a while there. And he, he ran that for a long time. It's a great show. Uh, how did it end up in your lap? And what's that been like? Yeah, it's a pretty crazy story the way it worked out. So you, as you know, Crazy Ace uh, had it. I, I can't remember. I think he had it 89 to 91 or something like that. Or 88 to 91 or somewhere in there. And, and I think J.D. Crow was involved in that in some sort of way. And then uh, Billy Easton took it over in 93 and ran it until 2010 when he passed away. Um, and then in 2010, when he passed away, his daughter inherited it. And then she gave it to Nate Drew and CJ Starkey, who run the Salt Lake City Convention. Uh, and then they took it over. So they live in Salt Lake City. And so when they took it over, it was very difficult for them to kind of keep it, um, you know, keep, give it the love that it needed because they were so far away you know, with local uh, promotion and all that stuff. So, you know, there was a lot of like kind of people circling the drain, like, you know, looking for another tattoo convention to, to ramp up in, in Richmond. And there was a, a, a convention out in Virginia Beach ran by Mike Can uh, in, in Hampton Roads, ran by Mike Can and a couple other guys. And they had reached out to me about throwing one in Richmond and they wanted me to be a, a partner with them. And so I was like, damn, man, I'm going to catch a lot of flack for this. But the Richmond convention just wasn't, uh, wasn't what it used to be. You know, it just wasn't getting the love it used to get. And, you know, for, for obvious reasons, because those guys were all the way across the U.S. trying to run it. And so I was going to throw the convention with these guys. And, but I felt like the right thing to do was to call Nate Drew and, and tell him that I was going to do it. I didn't want to just do it. Uh, and be shady about it. So I called up Nate Drew and I said, Hey man, you know, I'm going to throw a convention in Richmond. Um, you know, I, I just, you know, obviously I wanted to do more of a progressive show and the Richmond show had turned into a more of a traditional show at that point. And, uh, so I felt like we wouldn't be totally competing. Um, but I talked, when I talked to Nate, he was just like, man, I wish you would let me know. I'm really looking for someone who lives in Richmond to help me out with, with the Richmond show. And I was like, well, if stuff doesn't work out with these other guys, I'll let you know. And I ended up working out with the other, working with the other guys and shit kind of went sour. So I ended up hitting up Nate and Nate brought me on to the crew. Uh, so we were going to throw the convention, me, him and CJ Starkey. And, uh, you know, a couple months went by and uh, I guess they had decided they didn't want to throw the show anymore. So they basically just gave the show to me and they also gave it to this other guy named Kenny Brown, who I'd never met before. So I got forced into a partnership with a guy who I'd never met before. Oh. And the crazy thing is, is like this, I had worked at Salt Lake City co convention uh, a couple months prior. And I remember being at the convention and seeing this guy at the show and, and he was just so obnoxious and annoying and loud. And I was like, God, man, I really don't enjoy being around people like that. And sure enough, that was the dude they ended up partnering me with. 
And so I was like, okay, I'm going to try to make this work. So I ended up meeting with, his name is Kenny Brown. And I ended up meeting with him and he's ended up being one of my best friends in the whole wide world. And I, I absolutely love the guy. We get along really well and we work, we run a great convention together. You know, we, we both have our own little sections that we take care of and, it ended up being a really great partnership and it's just nuts because this was like a partnership that just happened and it wasn't something that was like, Oh, you're my friend. Let's partner up. It was just like some random dude. Uh, and it ended up working out great. You know, sometimes just having a shared goal is all it takes. If you enjoyed that clip with Jesse, go to www.virtualtattoogathering.com, find the replays and the full uh, interviews there. It's over an hour long and Jesse has uh, got a lot of great things going on, including benefits, different products, and whatnot. So if you're a tattooer or a collector, you definitely want to check it out. Then after this next sponsor message, we dig into the interview with Carrie Barba. Hello, my name is John Mess, and I am the owner of No Idols Tattoo. I've been tattooing since 2007, and I started my career here in the wonderful city of New York. The shop is located right on the Bowery, which is the heart of New York City and modern tattooing. And unlike years past where tattoo shops used to be down in the basements, we're actually located in the second floor in a very roomy loft type environment. So at No Idols, we're always looking for new guest artists and resident artists. We're big on collaborating. We're big on growing as artists and about expanding our abilities in tattooing and artistically. So if you like that kind of environment and that's something you like to be involved in, we invite you to come over and work with us for, you know, anywhere from a few days to a week or two weeks and experience uh, New York City all for yourself and the environment of working at No Idols. Being in New York City, it just brings all sorts of people from all walk of life and people from all over the country and even the world. Uh, lots of our clients and walk-in artists are just tourists and <clears throat> for that, we love to offer them a really awesome experience of what New York City's like. If you're looking for a guest spot and you're looking to come out and hang out with us in New York City, uh, the best way to contact us is through our email, which is noidolsnyc at gmail.com. And if you're an artist, feel free to also reach us out uh, through our Instagram uh, and it's noidolsnyc and uh, just shoot us a DM and we can start our communication from there. Okay, well, I'm uh, uh ecstatic to be with the ever inspirational Carrie Barber. She's been uh, smashing borders for a, a long time, uh, both uh, culturally, uh, stylistically, and just with uh, you know, a fantastic attitude. Um, thanks again for thanks. taking the time. And uh, yeah, well, obviously you have uh, one of the most amazing historic shops, and it would be remiss not to ask about you know, some of the history. How did uh, it come about and how'd you get yeah, it? And... Super lucky, I think, um, super lucky, yeah. So. Rick Walters, you know, he yeah. was the last manager of the shop there, um, which is now Outer Limits, but it used to be Burt Grimms. Burt Grimms, yeah. Burt Grimms, yeah. right? So it's been Burt Grimms since Burt took it over in 1954. Mm -hmm. And but when was it established? Was it 1927. 27. So it's said to be the second oldest shop in the world mm -hmm. um, as far as brick and mortar, right? Oh. So. Oh. We have been running it since uh, ourselves since 2000. We took it over in 2003. But what happened was, is Rick came to me and he's like, Carrie, I think you should buy the shop. You know, because uh, Bob Shop passed away. Well, Bert, you know, moved away and then Bob Shop passed away and he left it to his wife, um, who then passed away and left it to their three sons. Two of those sons are tattooers, Larry and Bobby, right? So they were trying to run the shop from Houston. This wasn't going well for them. Um, they decided they were going to close the shop or sell the shop. So he says, Carrie, I think you should buy the shop. And I was already what, running. What, what were you feeling yeah, when you said that? Like, oh, no. <laughs> no, I don't want to run another shop. I was, you know, had run up to serious. seven shops. Seven seven shops. Times, so I was down mm -hmm. to four. And I, three at the time, and I thought, gosh, I just don't want to handle another shop. I just don't want to do that. Um, but he kept talking to me. And then one day the doors closed, mm -hmm. and we heard the doors closed. And I thought, there's too much history there. You know, we got to save the history of that location and all the artists that have gone through there and the memories. So, where are going to people going to go in the United States if they don't have that historical shop to go to? 
So we bought the shop. Um, it was empty at the time we took it over, so basically just bought the space. Uh, everything was gone. You know, the artists who had worked there before had, you know, all taken a memory. So they all took a piece with them, kind of cleared it out. Sure. And um, so then once we got the location, the job was mine to see what we could retain and what we could get back, right? So trying to search Spend out. Years trying to find the collection. Yeah, trying to search out like who took what, what would they let me buy back? You know, how, what could I afford to buy back? And then, you know, finally got into the shop and then you realize you have millions of things to redo because we, we had to buy the space, right? So then you've purchased it. So then all these new laws come into effect. So it wasn't move in and work, you know? You were working, but you weren't supposed to be working. Right, right. right? So there was a, whole, a lot of renovations, right? So three years down the road, it took us to turn that thing around and get going. Fully get settled in. Yep. Yeah. But that's pretty amazing. So it's been going continuously since 1927. What is the, is the tattoo shop in Jerusalem that's older? Or what, what's the oldest? You no, know, the one in Jerusalem, I was told, is not an actual shop, okay. right? I was told that it's a family who's been tattooing for... 700 okay. years continuously. I've just read the Facebook right? headlines. So. Yeah, so the oldest shop, we are told, is in uh, in Denmark, or is it in uh, Belgium? See, I know, I've talked to the guy online, and now I feel bad that I don't remember the name of the shop. But, awesome. but that's the oldest one, I think. He's about nine years in front of us. Um, so we feel extremely fortunate. Oh, it's amazing the amount of history, like we were saying, the people that have come through there. So you have a, obviously have a full museum there now too, so it's a, people can come and check out the history. Correct. What, so, what can they see? What, what do you have? So we try to add to it all the time. You know, we have acetate stencils, we have a lot of old machines, we have old business cards, flash on the wall. Not too much flash. You know, we try to high focus on one shirt sheet per different artist. Okay. So as we attain them, then we frame them up and get them on the wall. Awesome. Uh, photos of the shop throughout the years when we can find them, and other shops in the Pike. So we focus on the area of Long Beach. The Pike is what it was called. It was like an amusement area, right? And so there was, you know, twelve tattoo shops there at one time. So it, you know, Bert owning owning as many as five of those shops. So he, you know, nobody knew he owned all five. So he'd be like, "Oh yeah, you don't like what I do? Go to so and so." You know, he, he's making the money anyway, right? So it was, it was fun for him. Sure. You know. It must be uh, that you have people come in and uh, make a pilgrimage there and to exchange stories. All the time. Sometimes we have people come in and they'll be like, "I got, you know, old timers. I got my first tattoo here." We try to take pictures of them and share them on Instagram, and we try to share histories of history stories, you know, sure. on Instagram, on Facebook, as much as we can, also to get the knowledge out there to other people. Tattoo was a completely different world, obviously, in the, in the late '70s and the early '80s, and you were vital in bringing a sense of professionalism to, to tattooing, uh, which is known for being wild and crazy. Uh, can you talk about like? how you can uh, work with artists but expect them to be professional. You know, thank God that the rules are changing because it's made it easier for me because back in the beginning it was very difficult. So, um, you know, starting out tattooing back then, we didn't wear gloves, we didn't cover anything, you know, you just tattooed. I mean, you know, and going even further back, it was even, you know, dirtier, I'll say, you know, because back in the beginning of, you know, tattooing and in this country, or possibly even other countries, right? You had the the sponge and bucket. Slot buckets. <laughs> right, right. The stool, the slot bucket, where one client sits down, they do the tattoo, they use using the same water, same sponge, you know, same needles all day long. It's going along like that. And when I came into tattooing, it, it wasn't much better than that, you know? It was somewhat better because you were maybe using clean, we used, used to use Kleenex. Right? So, you know, you're using clean box of Kleenex, but people were still using the same needles all the time, so sterilizing things was, uh, wasn't really heard of too much, you know. Sometimes you'd see a sterilizer in a shop, but they were usually rusted shut, right? Or they cooked food in it, you know, they did things like that, so they weren't used, right? It wasn't thought of to wear gloves, people just didn't do that. So, 
I didn't think of it either for quite a while. It was, you know, maybe, I don't know, it was in the first year. And I was, I used to hate that feeling of the blood and ink just drying on my hands, you know, and I hated that. So, you know, I'd always stop and like wiping my hands and washing my hands off, you know, constantly and wiping down my counter. I'm kind of a clean freak, so it was really hard for me. And I'm like, why can't I, can I wear some gloves? Can I just buy some gloves like the doctors wear? And that was that. From that day, gloves from then out. And then I got the great idea and I, I just, you know, was working on the same day I was wearing the gloves and I thought, what if I put a baggie on my bottle? I wouldn't have to wash it. Uh-huh. You know, that's how it started to grow. Amazing. You're like literally coming up with these ideas. Yeah, as I'm, as I'm tattooing. And so I started covering everything. At that time, thinking I didn't have to wash things, but you know, now we know you have to do both, right? You, you cover things, but you still have to clean it and cold sterilize it and all of that. But at the time, it seemed like a shortcut and a quicker way to get to the next client, right? So I could move faster, you know? I was going from one to the next to the next. Uh, so today, you know, getting an artist to think clean is much easier. Um, of course, it depends on how they were brought up or learned or apprenticed or. You know, where they came from, but they're much more willing because they see the benefit in it. And the knowledge is, is there commonplace right. as opposed to... Now, so speaking of like knowledge being commonplace now, uh, again, that was much different. You know, uh, you always hear the stories of tattooers telling their secrets about the wrong formulas, or, or they're giving like 90% of the things to do with the, the important 10% they leave out. Um, how do you feel that's changed? Did you have to fight? Did you have to fight that kind of misinformation? Or, I'm not sure. Um, I did an apprentice, right? So I didn't have that. I didn't have anybody teaching me, really. I did have uh, a friend who was a tattoo artist, and he was very open to sharing, and I'm not sure why, uh, but he was very kind and would share information. Uh, but you're right, the majority of people did not. You know, they didn't want to tell you where to get stuff, they didn't want to tell you how to go about it. You know, it was very secretive. And, you know, because that's their livelihood and they were trying to protect that, right? It was important. Um, and as you can see today, tattooing has exploded, you know? It's an industry. It's one of the biggest money-making industries in the world, I think. Crazy, yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, as a whole, you know? But so it has so, one of the most impact. Yeah, and it's definitely changed over the years. And a lot of that, I think, is just gradual new generations coming up with new fresh ideas and you know along with things like universal precautions, sharing information, you know, working together, those things are, are new ideas that are constantly growing, teaching other people and helping other people to be good. You know, we can look at that and say to ourselves, that's a great thing, it makes you feel good inside when you help somebody become better. Um, not everybody feels that way, of course, and it's a difference of opinion, you know, because it makes it harder, it cuts the pie thinner, right? So, you know, you have to find a balance. Sure. That was fun when people are, are talking about it slowing down, and you know, I'll ask some of those simple questions, do you email your mailing list to satisfied clients? You know, do you give them 10 business cards? No, I just update the Instagram, and it's harder now. Mm. Uh, it feels like some of those fundamental uh, tools of building clients before you had the internet. You still the same, you do a great tattoo on somebody and uh, you show them an, an amazing experience that helps them become better people. Yeah. They come back to their friends. That's right, right. So uh, you've obviously traveled the world and, and tattooing is uh, one of the beauties of it is it's, it's a global art. Um, but now California in particular always seems to have a great influence on, on the culture at large. Um, how, did, how do you feel the, the tattooing scene in California uh, has influenced uh, tattooing? Well, I think that the main influence and the biggest thing that California has done, and we got to give credit right there to people like Charlie Cartwright and Jack Rudy, um, bringing black and gray to the world of tattoo, right? And so I think that's the biggest influence right there, is, is that change, you know? And yes, it was happening at the time, but it wasn't done professionally, right? So it wasn't brought into the tattoo shops and shown to be uh, a viable art that people would love, right? It was basically in uh, jails, right? Um, you know, done in some garages here and there. 
because that's all they can get. But to show it as an art form and start doing things like portraits and things with detail was quite exciting. And that spread pretty dang fast once that once it hit. I mean, I was in Minnesota at the time. Um, I started in '79. I think Jack started in '75, right? So he was doing that black and gray and. You know, hearing about it, I wasn't even into tattooing before 79, I knew nothing about it. So I started, I didn't know about it when I first started tattooing, and I thought, well, why is everything so basic and simple, you know? We should be able to do more detail, right? And that's how they thought, they did the same thing and made that big change, you know. So I think and, then, it's fantastic. and then you took it a step further and brought color realism into... Uh, yeah, that was my next thing, I'm like, okay, we have to do this all in black and gray, we got to be able to do realistic stuff in color, why can't we do that? You know, and I, this is, I was just joking about this yesterday actually, because, you know, the new thing is the micro miniature tattoos, the, all that detail in this much space, right, all done a little dot at a time. So when I didn't know how to tattoo, that's what I did first, right? I was like, okay, my, my sister wanted this blue bird on a branch, right, with a bunch of tree and the flowers and all that stuff, and she wanted it that big on her shoulder, no problem. So I did that, and it looked great for a little bit, right? Yeah, for a little bit, and it was the thing I did for quite a while. It was super detailed as I could get it, as small as I could get it, you know? Uh, I gave that up eventually, yeah. you know? I still sometimes do too much detail, and I'll see it later, and I'll lose it, right? And then I get all bummed out, you know, because you just want it to stay, yeah. right? Stay. Do, do, do you find that uh, the modern tools uh, have a different, they produce better effects or different effects? Or is skin just skin, so no matter what tool you use, it's going to always be in the same way? Well, I'm really bad at that part because my entire career I didn't even know how to fix my machine. I just, however it ran, is what I used. How it ran? Yeah, I didn't know anything about it, you know. So people used to make fun of me, like, how do you do that tattoo with that piece of junk machine you're using, you know, it's falling apart, it's not running right, it's going to <laughs> So, I was quite lucky. Um, so I'm not 100% sure, but I do know that uh, right now I use rotaries, you know, I've switched to that because it saves my hand, right? That's why I first switched in, in 08. I started using rotaries and have completely switched over and haven't used a... Did you, did you have a purple tunnel or did you were you able to avoid it? I have it in both hands. I have arthritis. I have, you know, constant, you know, pain in the hand yeah. of some sort or another. Sure. Um, and it, it makes it a lot easier for me and I, follow, I find, personally, that I can do what I need with rotaries. And I know some people don't feel that. You know, and it's a difference of opinion. Everybody likes to drive a different car, you know, wear different clothes. So it's whatever you like, right? Absolutely. Is there any advice that you could give younger tattooers or, or any tattooers to help uh, make their body last longer in this crazy uh, business? We talk about this all the time at the shop. So we keep foam rollers at the shop, mm -hmm. you know, because you're in the middle and you're like this all day. So on breaks, we go back in the back and we get down on the floor and we get uh, on the foam roller. Awesome. You know, we try to get people to work their core, you know, do the hand stretches. Yeah. I started doing yoga a while back and it's made a huge difference. Awesome. Uh, I just think any time physical activity and stretching is going to help, you know, absolutely. And moving your body the opposite way that you move it when you're tattooing. Yeah. It's like the that, other direction. You know, it's, uh, my wife recently went through something similar. She teaches infants, so she's always carrying one or two babies. And so doing this for yeah. 25, 30 years, all of those stuff. All of it. It's the yeah. exact and opposite. You, you, you more and more, you start to round forward, and you're sitting like this, and I'm constantly like having to correct myself and say, sit up straight. You know, like right now, sit up straight. <laughs> yep, yep. Sit up straight. Uh, I, I, I always hear the uh, shoulders back. It's important. It's very important. I have an apprentice currently, and one thing I stress to her is, I need you in the gym. I need you to work your core. Need you to do these stretches, and you can't be lazy with it. Awesome. You got to be regular. You gotta keep it going. Those effects are like compounding effects. Yeah, yeah. consistency. Yeah. Yes. That's awesome. So you picked up an apprentice. Uh, how long had it been since your previous? Uh, Twenty-five years. Twenty-five so years. Twenty-five years ago, and she still works with me. She's actually my partner in my business now. Yes. And this year, uh, we decided to do that, and she's been working there and helping me run the shop ever since. Awesome. You know, so it's finally like, okay, you will help. Sure. You know, so took took that on. 
and Jenny, who is my apprentice currently, she works shop yeah. help, and um, she has very promising talent in art. And I kept hearing little rumors that she wanted to tattoo, and that's the last thing you want to hear, you know. <laughs> you know. Yeah, everybody who comes in wants to learn to tattoo. And I kept telling her no. And she left for a while, she went off, she finished her master's, came back. Uh, she actually climbed the shop. She is. She started that way yep. uh, in Anaheim, in my Anaheim shop, and then ended up coming doing shop help in my Long Beach shop, right at the pike. And then she came back after she went back to school, and uh, I just kept watching her draw, and I thought, man, she would be really good, you know? And she became so close to everybody. She's friends with everybody in the shop. Everybody loves her. And I just thought, okay, if I'm going to do it, this is going to be the person. And um, talk to her. Did it. Oh, she's got a good spot. Does it right? <laughs> she is too. Uh, our, our first thing we had her that I had her do was history. So I uh, made her start helping me put together uh, PowerPoint. You know, she's good on the computer, I'm not. So, okay, you get it. This is your niche, let's use it, right? So, we're going to do some history. Awesome. This is the people I know at the Pike. Who else can you find? You know, we had a list. What else can you find them? And what you, what years did they work here? How long did they tend to? Tell me a story about each one of them. So you'll periodically see those posted awesome. on social media because she's the one who posted them. So uh, tattoo conventions are another uh, uh, thing that evolved dramatically back in 79. Were, were there, when was the first? Uh, I think the first convention, I'm not sure because I wasn't in the business yet, but I, I've heard as far back as 76. Okay. Um, the first one that I went to was on the Queen Mary in 1982. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Did you put, put, um, put that on? Or? Yeah, Ed Hardy, Ed Nolte, and Bunny Croft. The three Eags. Uh -huh. And it, it was actually a fantastic convention. I remember, you know, Greg Irons was there. Uh -huh. Most young people don't know about Greg, but God, what a talent. Great illustrator, really. Yeah, fantastic. Great guy. Loved him. So many great artists, and I had been tattooing, you know, since 79, but in a shop. And if you want to watch the full interview of any of these interviews, then you can find them on our YouTube channel. Well, there we go. Thank you very much for watching. Please leave us some comments, find these tattooers, you know, on the Instagram, send them some messages, let them know that you appreciate the time that they took to do these interviews. I certainly do. I learned so much that I can't stop. Lastly, if you are interested in more of these videos, if you want to uh, talk with more tattooers and apprentices, collectors, all of everything, virtualtattoogathering.com. Once a month, we're going to get together and do two days of a virtual tattoo convention. And, uh, you know, we're hoping to do this more and more. Already reinventing is opening up their booth a couple days a month now, and Tattoo Now is probably going to do the same. So, like I said, thanks again. Let all the artists know that you love them. Let the sponsors know that you love them. And let us know what we could do better. We'll talk soon. Thanks. Why don't you let us know in the comments who you want to see us interview?